Get your Bibles. We're jumping back into it. We are in John chapter 14. If you're here online with us, hello online people. We're so glad that you're with us. And um, there's notes there in the chat room somewhere or in our website. And there's notes out there if you want them. If we run out of copies, we can get you more. We do cover a lot of material. And like always, I entrust that the Lord will take a sentence or a concept or a paragraph and apply it to your life. The prayer always is on Sunday morning that God would give us ears to hear what he's saying. Ultimately, the authority is in the word of God based upon the character of God. And so we turn to it so that we can learn, that we can hear, that we can apply these things to our life. So if you've been with us for a while, we've been working through the Gospel of John. Chapter 14, we, this is the setting of the scene that the disciples are there, okay? Upper room, the city of Jerusalem is swelled with people. There's great anticipation as to what would happen with this one called Christ. Jesus washed the disciples' feet, giving them example that we are to indeed serve one another in that way. He told the disciples there that we are to love each other as he had loved them, as he loves us. He was instructing them and preparing them for what was going to come. And he told them many um, months, if not years before, that he would be crucified. But there was this, well, how can that be and what's going on? He also said that someone would betray me, and right in chapter 13, we saw who this was, as Jesus indicated that it was indeed Judas the betrayer, or Judas Iscariot. Judas had left the room, and the disciples were wondering, who is going to do this? Who will betray you? Not knowing that was him, that was Judas, even at that time. And Peter stood up and said, hey, Jesus, I would never betray you. I would lay my life down for you. Jesus then turned to Peter and said, Peter, dear Peter, I want to let you know something that before the rooster crows, before the dawning of this dark, dark night, you will deny me, not once, but three times. Now, could you imagine if you were the other apostles and this strong man, this leader of the pack, did not or would not have the strength to not just give his life, but to associate himself with Jesus? (laughs) They were troubled, right? And right before this passage, it says Jesus was troubled in spirit, troubled as to what would happen per se, to Judas, troubled that these things were now here, and now the disciples are troubled. And into that context, we read now this passage, chapter 14, where Jesus now addresses the troubled heart. This is the first point, and I'm asking us to do three things from the text First one is, number one, to believe in Jesus. We're going to unpack this. So he says in chapter 14, starting with verse 1, do not let your hearts be troubled. Now let's just pause right there. What strikes me about that verse is, number one, that our hearts are troubled, troubled about an unknown future, right? Have you ever felt that before? What's going to happen in the world? What's going to happen to my children? What's going to happen to my marriage? Where am I going to live? What am I going to do? Is the end coming? Am I going to be attacked? And on and on and on. Will I pass this test? Will I get that job? Will things work out? We are prone to troubled hearts. We say amen, right? We're troubled this way. And these disciples were undoubtedly troubled as to what was going on. Because they had given their life to follow this one named Christ. They left friends, they left family to follow him. They believed that he may be the Christ, or certainly he is the Christ. And now they couldn't follow him. Now he was going to be betrayed. Now things were quite 
uncertain and dark, and it was night. Perhaps you have felt that way, or perhaps you feel that way even today. I don't know because I cannot see what is next. And Jesus says, do not let your heart be troubled. By the way, who has responsibility for their own heart? Who has the responsibility? I'm glad you're pointing to yourself. So this tells me of Jesus' instruction to us that we are responsible to govern our own heart. Which tells me then that you and I have the choice. We have power to speak into and govern our heart. Do not be troubled or do not let your hearts be troubled. So you and I have to take responsibility to what our heart is doing, what it's focused on, and what's going on there. So you have a responsibility, right? Jesus didn't say, hey, let me untrouble your heart or just hold still, I'm going to pray for you and all the trouble is going to go away. He didn't, he didn't say that, right? He says, hey, you, do not let your heart be troubled. Okay, so I'm responsible. I have an option here. And then Jesus very carefully tells them and tells us why our heart shouldn't be troubled. And then he adds to it, now you have these reasons, now this is what I want you to do. So we're going to see that in this passage. So again, he's speaking, do not let your hearts be troubled. That would have gotten my attention because surely my heart would have been very troubled at this moment as our hearts at times are. Let's continue to read. These are the reasons and we're going to break them down. So do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And now Jesus goes on and describes what is upcoming, what he was going to do. That helps us. Verse 2. Now my father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? Now, if I go and prepare a place for you, that means I will come back and take you to be with me. That you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. So let's take a look at this. Right? So Jesus says, now, let me tell you, do not let your hearts be troubled. Now, I'm going to give you some reasons why that will help you to focus your heart, that will give you some peace and some rest. He says, all right, do you believe in God? Right? That is a natural starting place. This is the creator of the universe. This is the standard of all standards. This is the one who speaks and everything comes into existence. He tells them, do you believe in God? Asking them a question, and that's the same question to us here, which not perhaps all of us do. Yes, I believe in God. So say, okay, that's a good starting point. Now, second, believe also in me, is what Jesus said. Believe me, you believe in God that's established. Now believe also in me. This is where the believing in Christ means. Now he gets very, very specific. Here are some things that will help your troubled heart that you need to fixate and focus on about the future. Number one, Jesus has prepared a place for me. Do you believe that? This is what he says. Hey, I'm going to let you know, Jesus was saying his disciples and to us, my father has a house. And some of you from the 90s are singing big, big house, right? <laughs> Audio adrenaline, you know what I'm talking about. You're like, what are you talking about? Old song, right? In my father's house, knowing that there's a dwelling place where God lives, right? In that place, there are many rooms. There is room for you, and he was going to prepare a place for you. This means that if you believe or by believing in Jesus, you have a place in the house of God. This is your final and eternal 
dwelling place. No matter what happens in life, your end is secure. That helps. You will dwell in the house of the Lord. How long? This gives us peace, right? He has prepared this place. Well, how, right? And some people, when they, they read this, they think of Jesus, you know, the carpenter up there in heaven, working in his father's house. Well, I got to paint this color. She likes pink, right? Oh, that door is a little squeaky. Let me put a little WD-40 in there, right? Jesus up in heaven with his tool belt, you know. Oh, better get going. There's about a million coming in today, right? By the way, Scripture also says that this place has already been prepared before the creation of the world, right? So does the God who can speak the world in existence need Jesus with a hammer? No. He can say, be done. Boom! It's done. So he's not physically up there, you know, building you your house or your room. It's done. So when he says he's preparing, he's preparing the way. And the last thing needs to be to have the house be prepared is he's there. Ta-da! The Father's house is more, uh, it's less about a place, it's more about a relationship, right? Who's there that matters. A house without love, a house without the presence of other people is just a shell, but a house becomes a home when there is relationship and love and communion and community. So Jesus is saying to them, boys, don't let your heart be troubled. Let me tell you what's going to happen. I'm going to go to my father's house. I'm preparing a place for you. Okay? There is a place in heaven for you. Your story ends well. Second, Jesus is going to come and get me. These are promises of God. I will come back. You might need to circle that. He's like, well, if I think about it, I might come back. I might find you, but you may make it obvious. You can put on your your orange jumpsuit and jump up and down, then I'll recognize it's you. He doesn't say that. I will come back. Do you understand the weight of that promise? If he says he's going to return, that means that he will (gasps) return. That should help us. So when we are ready to take our last breath here, on the other side, Jesus is going to meet you. You don't enter eternity alone. You enter by the grace of Jesus Christ who is with you forever. We do not have to be troubled as to what comes next when we die because Jesus promises he's going to come and get you and me. So Jesus was telling his disciples, this is not the end of the story. When I am killed, when I give my life away, I am living and I am preparing and I will come back for you. It's going to be okay. Also, he says, I will dwell with Jesus forever. Where he is, he will also, we will also be. Your story ends And they lived happily ever after. I don't know what chapter you're in right now in your story. Every good story has some drama. Some things to overcome. Some heartaches and heartbreaks. Some opportunities, some choices. We love stories. We love movies. We love to tell them because that is the language of our heart. You're in your story right now. I don't know what the next page is, but I've read the end and it's really good. That should give you hope. 
And not only is the ending good, that Jesus is with us in every chapter of every story. Leading, guiding, encouraging, protecting, encouraging. All of these things in our hearts. So he's saying to them, boys, pay attention. Don't be troubled. Focus in on these things. That when you die, you will be alive. That I am there preparing a place for you that's secured. I will come back and get you. Our relationship is forever. And that we'll be in this house forever. It all ends well. You will have the happiest of endings. And it will all be put right in the end. But right now, we don't understand how all the threads of the story fit. Have you guys seen a tapestry? You know what I'm talking about? Tapestry, these things. Where on one side, you know, it's sewn in, 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 sewn in. Okay? Often our life in the earth is like looking at this tapestry from the back, right? We look at all these things and all this stuff and all these cords and all this, and we're like, hmm, we can kind of figure it out. We can kind of see a pattern. One day, that thing is going to be turned around, and you, it's going to take your breath away. God, this is what you're weaving in my story. This is what you have done. So Jesus helps us to be at peace. Focus in on these things. And some of us are scared to death. I'll tell you right now, some of you got to stop watching the news. Why? Well, do, do I want you to be informed? Yeah, be informed. Building a bunker in your basement and some of you are doing this is not what Christ instructs us to do. Now you may think, well, 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 the point is that I have peace in my heart. You're not the point of the story Christ is. Peace in your heart is a means to an end. Once we have peace, or even if we're troubled, we have things to do, right? Well, God just wants me healthy and happy so I can sit here and coast into eternity. Phooey! That's not the story. <laughs> the story is that he empowers us to do his work on the earth, right? To make a difference, to shine his glory, to be about his or our father's business. Are you hearing me? Right. Now, is there peace along the way? Of Certainly. Is there joy along the way? Certainly. Is there friendship along the way? Certainly. Are there things to overcome? We can say, uh-huh. Right? Like I said last week, there is zero unemployment in the kingdom of God. So Jesus first dealt with their heart, and he first deals with our hearts. Do not let your heart be troubled. And if you are having a troubled heart, I want you to focus on the promises of Jesus that he will get you through. It will help. Right? Now, the next thing Jesus is asking us to do is found in verse 5 through 7. Title is, Walk in Jesus. So first, I want you to believe in Jesus. You believe in God, believe also in Jesus. His promise, his life, what he says to us. Second, we are to then walk in Jesus. So Jesus continues on after telling them, hey, guys, calm your heart. Now, let's talk about what is next to do, right? And some of them had questions, right? And good old Thomas Right? who was very concrete. He says, well, I'm not going to believe unless I will read this in the future. I won't touch his side and, and, and feel the wounded marks. I won't believe until I see it. Mr. Concrete Thomas had a question. Wait a second, Jesus. You said that you're going away and we know the way. And so he, then he asked this question in verse 5. Thomas said to him, um, Lord, we don't know where you're going. Even though he just said to the Father's house, but he didn't know where the Father's house was. So if we don't know where we're going, um, how can we know the way, right? Here's what Jesus says. Jesus answered, I am the way. He says, not only that, I'm the truth. And I am the life. Thomas, cross point, you in this church building, 
no one comes to the Father except through Christ or me. Verse 7, now if you really knew me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So Jesus' response to this question, how, where are you going? How do I get there? He says, the only way to the Father's house is through me, right? Through me. Thomas, if you want to go to the Father's house, you have to follow me. Because I'm the way to the Father. I'm the truth of the Father. I'm the life of the Father. And if you are to come to the Father and his house, you can only do so through me. Now, that means a few things. Number one, we have to continue to walk in the way of Jesus. Do you hear me? Right. How you start matters, but how you finish matters more. Right. Are you continuing in the grace of God? Right. Are you continuing to walk in the way of Christ? We must continue to follow him until the very end because there is no other way to the Father. The good news is that all who follow Jesus can enter the Father's house. We can say amen to that. Right? And the flip side of that is that no one can get in without going through Christ. Right? So continue to walk in Him. Walk in His way. Follow Him. So your heart is settled. Oh, follow Christ. Well, Jesus, what Jesus says, secondly, is the truth. What he says about the nature of creation is true. What he says about what is yet to come is true. Who God is is who Jesus is. And we are in the light of him who made us to be and everything there is. Jesus says the truth because he is the truth. He is the standard in which all things are measured. We'll see that Pilate asked Jesus the question, what is the truth? It's not what is the truth. The correct question is who is the truth? Who are we to believe? What standard in which are we to follow? And Jesus says, I am the truth. This is a profound statement. He didn't say, I speak the truth. He says, I embody the truth. I am truth. And then coupled with that, not just being the way, but being the truth, but being the life. Jesus is the life. And there is no life without him. Right? You know that? Scripture tells us that in Christ all things hold together. If Christ did not will it, your body would explode. This planet would vaporize. It holds together because God wills it to do so. All life, um, let me say this, <sighs> life did not come from non-life. Life comes from life. God, the uncaused cause, who eternally existed, has life in himself. Therefore, there is life on this planet. Jesus expressed that he is the life. There's other scriptures I have put in there. In all of these statements, again, he was saying that he is God, the I am so after our hearts are troubled, or excuse me, untroubled, <laughs> after we have settled our hearts by focusing in on the promises of Christ for your future, regardless of what happens, he is there, settles our hearts, then second, we must walk in Jesus, continuing to follow after him, reading his word meditating upon what he would say, and doing what it says, including mm, loving your enemies, 
praying for those who persecute you, including laying down your life for his glory, including crying out to him, including gathering together, including, this is the next thing, doing the works that God has designed for you to do. Last point, work in Jesus. We are to believe in Jesus. We are to walk in Jesus. Now we are to work in Jesus. So let's work through this passage. And I want you to pay attention to the word work here. All right, boys, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in me on the way, the truth, and the life. Follow after me. Now he says this in verse 8. Another disciple named Philip was here. He was part of the conversation. He said, Jesus, Lord, now show us the Father, right? You say you and the Father are one, so show us the Father, right? And that will be enough for us. Right? We'll believe, right? Most of them did at this time, but not everyone. Right? It's just kind of mind-blowing. Verse 9, now Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, Philip, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Significant statement. So how can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Now, the words that I say to you, I, I did not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Okay, let's just pause there. So if you've seen Jesus, you have seen the Father. Jesus was here to show us the Father. The Father in Jesus' life and his words, that we know his words came not on his own. His authority wasn't just Jesus saying, well, this is a good idea. He says, these are the words of God. God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. We would know him, and then we would know the Father, and we praise God for who he is. Now, an evidence, an evidence that Jesus is one with the Father, he's saying that the words that he spoke is the work of the Father. Okay, now this is important. So the Father's work, which was Jesus' words, are the evidence that Jesus and the Father are one. So God's work and the words, or the Father's work and the words of Jesus, and the words of Jesus give evidence that he and the Father are one. The work then is to give evidence of the identity of Jesus. The Father's work was to glorify the Son. The Spirit's work is to glorify the Son. The Son's work is to glorify the Father. Okay? And so the work of the Father God is to give evidence that Jesus indeed is who he says he is, okay? Let's continue, verse 11. So he established this. Now, Jesus said, believe me when I said that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or, at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Verse 12, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these, because I'm going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Right? This, what is going on here? <laughs> right? Jesus says that whoever believes in me, will do the works I have been doing. So we have to ask ourselves the question, what are the works that Jesus had been doing and what were their purpose? Now, Jesus said himself, he even says this in verse 11 here, that he says, hey, if you don't believe what I'm saying to you, believe on the evidence of what I have done, right? That I indeed am the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. So the purpose of the good works, in this case, in his case, not just his teaching, but his miracles, was to give evidence of who Jesus was. Okay. 
Now, this passage says, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. Do you believe in Jesus? So this is everybody, right? So does this then mean that we are to do the exact things that Jesus did, like walking on water? Have any of you walked on water? I've done it on skis. That's not the same. (laughs) If you look at the list of all the stuff that Jesus has done, including walking on water, feeding the 5,000, raising people from the dead, calming storms, healing blind eyes, all of this type of stuff, right? Have you done that stuff? Have you done all that stuff? The answer is mm, no. Did the apostles do all of that stuff? Not exactly. So what does this mean then? Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And by the way, in a little bit, this next chapter, we're going to read it, right? Talks about Jesus sending the Holy Spirit to us. And in sending the Holy Spirit, it is a confirmation that we're believers, but it's also empowering to do his works. And he describes some of these gifts, by the way, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13 is included, and in 14, it says that to some he gives ability to do miracles, and to others he gives ability to discern with spirits, and to another he gives the gift of speaking in tongues or what have you, okay? So it tells me that everyone has not been empowered to do these miraculous miracles. However, God has formed you as a masterpiece in Christ Jesus to do what? Good works that he's in Uh, uh, made in advance for you to do, which tells me then, okay, all of this to say that in our doing the works he has been doing, the things that God has asked you and equipped you to do, do these good works to give evidence that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. When you pay for someone's hotel room, It's giving evidence that God's love is in you and he's changed your heart. People don't do this naturally, but they do it because of the love of God. When you help your elderly grandparents, when you sacrifice in various ways for the benefits of others, when you have a change in your heart going from a um, self-centered, swearing sinner, right, into one who is pursuing Christ and becoming more like him, that's a miracle, right? And your testimony gives evidence to the power of God, the power of God seen in Jesus Christ that he indeed is God's son. So what we are saying here in the works, look at this, follow the the logic. Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. If you believe in him, you have a job to do. So even in the midst of uncertainty in our world, uncertainty in your life, Continue to believe in Jesus, continue to walk in Jesus, and then continue to do the work of Jesus, right? Stop hiding in your basement, cowering that the end of the world is coming, and get up and get out and do something, right? Love your neighbor, right? Proclaim Christ. Jesus is not coming until the whole world has heard of his name. How about get busy doing that, right? This is what Jesus was saying here, right? If you believe in me, then you will do similar works, as in things that God has equipped you and called you to do to bring glory to me. And you will do even greater things than this. More things. Why? Because the Holy Spirit, instead of being, uh, this Christ being here, he says, I got to go so I can send the Holy Spirit, which will be empowering all of you, and then I will send you to the various corners of the earth. You're going to have more time and go to other places. These are going to be greater things that are going to happen so that people would understand Jesus was saying that I am the Christ, right? Greater things. And you will see this as you continue to read down below. So this is what Jesus was saying. Now then he says, a couple of this, right? And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now, is this a blank check that you can do anything you want? Well, it says here, right? Ask anything for my name. So in the name of Jesus, I'm asking for a Porsche, a Lamborghini, and a pet pony, right? In Jesus' name. 
Amen. Right. Now, Jesus didn't put the qualifications here, and I have them in your notes of other places. He said, ask according to his will. There's, there's, there's things here. He didn't say that here. But it's impregnated or encapsulated in, in Jesus' name. So if we're saying then that our goal is to glorify God and give glory to Jesus, and God's asked us to do the works, expects us to do these works, then God will give us everything we need to do his works for his praise. Did you hear that, right? So if you praise God, will you give me power to love my wife? Is that God's will for you husbands to love your wife? The answer is yes. (laughs) God will answer that prayer so that you can say, God, help me to do this, but I don't have it in you. And God says, yes, I got you. I'll give you everything you need to do the works so that I will be glorified in you. <laughs> That's what this means. Right? And so if you say, hey, God is calling me to go to Kenya to serve him there. God, I trust that you provide for me to get there because I don't do it. He says, okay, I got you. Right? Or whatever it is in your life. Do you understand this flow here? So I don't want people to be disappointed. Well, I prayed in Jesus' name. And God didn't answer my prayer how I expected him or wanted him old or how I demanded him to do that. None of you would do that. (laughs) I've heard this lots. I don't believe in God because it doesn't work. What are you talking about? You obviously don't understand scripture, right? Why pray for my grandma not to die and she died? Your grandma's in a much better place. Stop being so selfish and get about the Lord's business. Oh, Dave, calm down. Okay. I'm just telling you. You hear me now, right? So you and I and we in the midst of troubled times. Okay, I'm trying to encourage you here. In the midst of troubled times, in the midst of not knowing what the future holds, be at peace focusing in on your heart, saying, heart, we're going to have a talk. You're a little anxious right now? Let me tell you a couple things. Your end's going to be good. Believe in Jesus, his promise. He's coming back. You'll be in his house forever, and it's going to be glorious. In the meantime, continue to walk in Jesus. Continue to trust him. Continue to following in his way. And thirdly, hey, I'm going to get busy doing the works of my father so that people who are here could understand that what's happening in my life isn't because of me, it's because of Christ to give him glory. Do you understand how that works? And you say, well, I don't have what it takes. Well, you don't, but Jesus does. So ask him in his name. I want to glorify you. God, give me what I need in order to do these works so you'll be glorified. And I trust you, not just for the ends and the means. You understand how this works together, right? This is what Jesus is saying about and in this passage. Please understand it. So I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to conclude. We're going to go downstairs. We're going to eat some food, and we're going to celebrate, and that's a good thing. Here comes the worship team. Yay, worship team. Now, I don't want this passage to be lost on you. Right? It's like, oh, that's like confusing, and there's a lot to it. No, there's a lot to it. Hopefully I've simplified it a little bit for us. But I'm going to trust that God is speaking to your heart today and that we together can engage with the will of God by the grace of God for the glory of God. All that he's asked us to do. So let's pray together. God, here we are uh, this morning. We've prayed a bunch and you know that. God, you know that there's a Tons of stuff going on in this room. Everyone has a life. Everyone has things inside that they're thinking about or mulling over. Everyone has been wounded in some way, and everyone has strength. God, none of us know for certain what's going to happen tomorrow or the next day or two years from now or ten years from now. I don't know. But Jesus, you told us enough that will help us with our uncertainty of the future. And God, I ask that in our hearts this morning, that we would focus, focus in on what's true about you. And in that, we would have peace knowing that you will not leave us nor forsake us and you are here with us along the way and your promises are true. God, will we... God, I'm asking for me, for this congregation, God, that we would continue in the way of Jesus until we see him face to face. Help us with that. Encourage us with that. Strengthen us in that. 
And God, we are grateful that you give us everything we need to do the work or the works that you've asked us to do. And so, God, will you confirm that word to this congregation today, this week, this upcoming months and beyond, that as they and we pray, we will experience your presence to empower us to do what you've asked us to do to give you glory. Do that in this congregation. Thank you for three years, God, of togetherness built on decades of faithfully following you. Glorify your name here in Rockford and to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.